Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you are enjoying. I'm actually not commissioner for climate, and that's probably the only time when you will hear the word climate from me during this speech. I'm commissioner for environment, but we have also commissioner for climate. Anyway, uh, probably you would assume that I'm speaking to many of the stakeholders. And uh, many times when I'm entering the room, they see in me either a Shrek or Incredible Hulk, in both cases, a bit of a green monster. But basically the story which I would like to share with you, it's a different story. It's a story of a concerned citizen. It's a story of uh, a father of two for whom I would like that they would have a bright future. It's a story of an economist, and it's also a story of somebody who happened to be Commissioner for Environment in the European Union. I would like you that you would basically leave after my speech with only one thing in mind. The change, it's unavoidable. The change in the way we produce, we consume, the change in the way we basically live. There are two sides of the arguments. One side are environmental arguments, and these are the arguments which are easier to understand, but not easy to hear. The other side of the arguments which I would also like to present to you today afterwards are economic arguments. But let's start with env environmental ones. I have read, it's a bit more than a year ago, in Nature, an article signed by many scientists, which in essence, if I would summarize it, saying human population growth and per capita consumption rate underlie all of the other present drivers for global change. So, population growth and per capita consumption. Let me talk first about the population growth. I'm pretty sure that you have all heard that before the mid of the century, we will be 9 billion on the planet. We are currently 7 billion. Let me translate that figure that you would understand it a bit better. That figure means that in just one generation, we will have on the planet additionally 2 billion population, which is more than was the total amount of population at the beginning of the 20th century. At the beginning of the 20th century was 1.5 billion. In one generation, this is more than 200,000 people per day. In one year, approximately, Germany. In seven weeks and two days, Belgium. In nine days and six hours, my own country, Slovenia. It's going so fast. The second reason is per capita consumption rate. There are estimates that a lot of people which are today living in poverty will move from poverty to the middle class consumption. Till 2030, approximately 3 billion are estimated to move from poverty to the middle class consumption. So what is the problem? Because all those things sound nice and we don't see the problem in that. The problem is that we are living in the world of limited resources. Fresh water, oceans, land, soil, clean air, raw materials, biodiversity, ecosystems, fuel, all of that is limited. There are estimates that if we continue like we are living now, we will need, by 2050, three times more resources than we are using today. 70% more of food, feed and fiber than we are using today. We will be 2030, 40% short of drinking water if we continue like we are living today. So, I think that if we take into account the fact that today, already by using and by living in a way like we are living, we are using 60% of ecosystems which are underpinning those resources in a way that they are degraded or unsustainable, you can come easily to the conclusion. We cannot go on like that. That has nothing to do with soft economic loss, but it has to do a lot with the hard loss of physics. So we need to change. We need to change the way we produce, the way we consume, and basically the way we live. But there are also other types of arguments which 
because environmental arguments nowadays are not the arguments which are easy heard. Since we are living in the crisis times, if you really want to be heard, it's good if you have also economic arguments on your side. Let me develop those arguments and they are connected with European Union. Why in European Union that change also makes economic sense? There are basically four core reasons. The first one is European Union, it's densely populated continent. We are locked in, in old industrial models where we use a lot of resources unsustainably. We are locked in, in infrastructure, in business models, locked in, in financial models. We are using 15 tons of resources per capita per year in Europe. Five tons of that becomes waste. Half of that, almost three tons, is landfilled. So, lost forever. The second argument is that after a century of declining resource prices with two exemptions, Second and First war, World War and oil crisis, the composite index of resources in the 20th century was falling. What happened at the beginning of this century is something which we call a hockey stick. The prices start to raise of resources very quickly. From 1998 to 2011, 300%. 85% of European companies are expecting that in the next five years, the resource prices they are using will still be increasing, and the volatility is extremely high. The third reason is that already today, European companies, if we look to Germany, which is not the cheapest country in the European Union, 40% of costs in their economy can be devoted, can be connected to resources, and only 18% to labor. Yet, we still talk only about labor productivity. Have you heard anybody talking about total factor productivity? And the fourth reason is that in Europe we are extremely import dependent. We import currently more than 60% of energy, with estimates that we might even overshoot 80%. We are importing half of everything what is inbuilt in our products. Just take the periodic system, chemical periodic system, and I can show you there exactly how much of which of the elements we are importing, rare earth, 100%. So if you take those four arguments together, the conclusion to which you can arrive is simple. Producing the products using less energy, less water, less raw materials, producing the products which are reusable, recyclable, makes economic sense. That's why the conclusion that we need to change, change the way we produce, the way we consume, the way we actually live, it's a logical conclusion. So, okay, we have developed the story till now, but let us try to see, do we have the answers on those questions? I should absolutely start by saying, uh, yes, we can, because in Belgium we are today hosting the American president, so, some of the facts which you might not know. There are inefficiencies all around us. Turning coal into light is still only 3% efficient. Only 15% of the energy we put in our petrol tank is used to move our car down the road. 80% of what we produce is used only once and then discarded. Only 1% of the valuable rare earth that we use in products are recycled at the end of the product life. And the ultimate inefficiency is, of course, that 80% of the resources are used by only 20% of the earth population, which is connected very much with the need of eradication of the poverty. Let me just give you one example. It's a product which I'm pretty sure you have all in your pockets. It's the mobile phone. You can produce your wedding ring, some of you are exactly in the right age now, by extracting 10 tons of gold ore, or by recycling 10 kilos of mobile phones. Yet, we today recycle less than 10% of mobile phones in Europe. More than 100 million are at the bottom of the drawers each year. If we would just recycle those in Europe, we would get yearly 2.4 tons of gold, 25 tons of silver, 1 ton of palladium, and 900 tons of copper. 
Not to mention that, of course, at the first place you not need to throw that mobile phone at the bottom of the drawer. You could, you could refurbish it to a state as good as new, which should be the next step in thinking how our answer should be delivered. One of the questions which I constantly have to address is, will the market do the job? I'm a believer in the markets. The markets are, still, are here to stay with us, that's pretty clear, because we don't have better redistribution mechanisms. But the fact is that markets cannot ensure efficiency in the allocation and use of resources if prices do not reflect the true value and cost of resources, which is today the case, if rewards to capital are disproportionate to other inputs, which is today the case, if managers on annual contracts are induced to make short-term investment decisions overly influenced by bonuses based on short-term share price, which is again today the case. Whenever I'm asked about the relationship between the markets and regulation, I tend to use an example of something which is as global as markets. This is football. Ask the best players on the field, do they want to have a good referee and do they want to have clear rules of the game? This is basically regulation. Only if you have a good referee and clear rules of the game, the best players are really the best players. Otherwise, you have a chaos on the field, and the one who prevails on the field is the most aggressive. And that's exactly what is happening today to our markets. And that's why we need a good regulation. That's why we need to send markets into the right direction. There are various areas. Innovation is something on which I believe, because human imagination has no limits. But you have to send it into the right direction. You need to have right policy signals. Products are also important. Whenever you design the product, you already make the destiny of that product. If you design it in a way that it cannot be reused and recycled, you will never reuse it and recycle. The major power also lies in the hands of us consumers. But for our decisions that they are informed, we need to be well aware of the essence of the products. Today we have 400 eco-labels globally. 48% of population does not believe anymore to the logos which are uh, which products are environmentally friendly. And finally, about the business models. We can also change the business models. It's not by owing something that we are using it. We can also share, lease. Those are the models which could be in the future much more used than basically the models of owing something which is today reality. Yes, it is a lot about eco-industries, but it's not only about eco-industries. They are more or less enablers for the rest of our economy. So the, basically, what is my message is that the whole economy has to change. So the words resource efficiency and circular economy are the ones which you will hear a lot. Why? Because they mean benefits for environmental preservation, but they are also major opportunities for the future economic development. Let me slowly start to conclude. We live in the 21st century, which is the century defined by fragility. We are more interconnected, interdependent than ever. And because of that, also our responsibility, individual and collective, it's much, much higher than it was responsibility of our predecessors. We need to change this fragile century into the century of sustainability. I have heard many times about the environmental policy making, how it should go. But I will try to tell you after four years being in this portfolio what I have learned. It's a bit simplified story, but it's not far from the truth. In the past, we have developed our environmental policies in a way that sectors, producers were following their interests and maximizing their profits and that was causing that our water was polluted, that the air we are breathing was also polluted. And when the same persons, the same persons came at home, take off the jackets, of course they wanted to have clear water, 
they wanted to have the air which is not polluted. They started to think like the citizens which are looking for a common good, for public interest. At that moment, the damage was already done. Because it is much better to prevent than to cure. The reasons are basically two. The first one, it's much cheaper. And the second one, you are not ill. So integration of the policies is crucial. Integration of environment into agriculture, fisheries, industry, uh, industrial policy, uh, transport policy, uh, energy policy, research policy, name it, whatever policy you wish. One of the reasons which I'm hearing why we should not today deal too much with environmental questions is because these are belonging to the future, while we should focus on short-term questions. That's illusion. Everything what I'm telling you, it's here and now. If we don't address it, that's the recipe for the future crisis, which will be deeper and much more difficult than the crisis we are living through. But there is one fundamental problem which we have with short- and long-termism. That is that a lot of our decisions are basically based on short-term logic. Tell me one name of a politician whom we have re-elected because she or he was thinking long-term. Tell me one name of an entrepreneur who was rewarded on the basis of five years' results, not on the basis of one-year results or even quarterly accounts. So yes, you can simply not manage the 21st century with short-termism anymore in mind. Environmental protection, it's not an obstacle to economic growth. That's an argument which I'm constantly hearing. It is just the opposite. Ignoring the environmental problems which we are seeing today, it's the best way how we will limit potential development in the future. If there is anything from which we can learn, it's absolutely nature. Because nature, it's the biggest and the best circular economy. It's the millions of years of adaptation, of accommodation. It's the system in which everything has a purpose and nothing is lost. We belong to the nature. And that's why we have to behave like we, beha like we are part of the nature. People are saying that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. We have obviously missed that point. But the second best time is now, it's today. You would certainly not like somebody like me standing in front of you after 20 years and telling you the same story. So, environment and economy are two sides of the same coin. We should simply stop flipping that coin. We are supposed, as humans, to be intelligent. We haven't yet proven that we are. That's still ahead of us. So, yes, the change, ladies and gentlemen, is unavoidable. And it will come, if we like it or not, it is better that we prepare for that. Thank you for listening to me.